then. Um, yes. If you don't mind, would you like to just introduce yourself, maybe talk a little bit about your background and your research, just anything you think that's relevant to the discussion? Yes, of course. I'm Daphne, Daphne Lusaki. I'm Greek. I studied as an agricultural engineer in a, in a city of Greece that is called Volos at the Agricultural University of Thessaly. And then uh, at the same university and with uh, Professor Mr. Katsoulas, I did my master studies. My thesis was mainly focused on remote sensing technologies that we can detect water and nitrogen deficiencies in plants. So after I finished my master studies, I tried to find a job. And that was really difficult in a, a really financial crisis, Greece. Mm. There were very Sorry. few opportunities for young people, specifically for young and female people. So I said, okay, maybe I have to figure out somewhere else where I should uh, focus on. Then I applied for a PhD at Opus University. I was accepted and my topic was vertical farming. And at that time, vertical farms were at their beginning, we could say, like five years ago. So I started my PhDs. I understood that the problem was about energy demand, lighting operation. So I focused mainly on the lighting. Since then, I'm working as a full-time postdoc researcher at Agricultural University of Athens, but I'm still also working as a remote part-time postdoc researcher at Opus University for vertical farming projects. So I honestly was beyond skeptical of it at the beginning. I just intuitively, I think of all the land that we have dedicated to agriculture and you're going to try to bring mm -hmm. that inside. It seemed untenable to me. And then plus with the, the push towards solar power now, it seemed like we could theoretically have a system where we're capturing sunlight with solar panels and then converting it to electricity to, to power grow lights. And then both the solar panels and those lights are like, pretty inefficient still. So I, I just thought there's no way this is ever going to happen. This and, and then I started seeing them like become real companies around here. And so it's like, okay, I'm still skeptical, but um, I at least have to <laughs> have to look into this now. So I'm mm -hmm. really interested in how the economics actually make this technology possible. Okay. The first thing that I want to say, so it can live out of the scene is that vertical farms are not in competition with open field agriculture and with greenhouses. Mm -hmm. They are an extra way of a cultivation method that can support people that they are living mainly in urban, intense urban areas. They are not able to save the world from uh, hunger uh, with massive and uh, stable food production because we don't have at that time the technology to support that. But the more that this concept is growing, it's going to be way more precise. Uh, the costs are going to be reduced. The efficiency is going to be increased as everything has happened until now with every other technology. At the beginning, everything is way more expensive and not that uh, efficient. But vertical farms start getting into the, into the economy and into research because of all the the advantages that they can provide to, to the people that want to have access to fresh, nutritious food that has grown close to them and hasn't traveled two or 3,000 miles, because that's the numbers uh, when it comes to open field agriculture. But also, traditional agriculture consumes almost 70% of the global consumable water. So... We have to improve these techniques. There are a lot of pesticides, herbicides, a lot of chemical inputs. Vertical farms came to support this uh, destruction of the ecosystem by more uh, resource use efficient solutions. So we apply hydroponic systems. We don't, we're not based in soil, but we have soilless cultivation methods, either hydroponic or aeroponic. And yeah, why don't you, yeah, go ahead and talk about like, the system itself, Some just systems. a little bit, just okay. so people have an idea of like what the technology yeah. entails here. So uh, vertical farms are well thermal insulated growing areas. We try to stay as much as we can uh, without getting interrupted by the outdoor environmental conditions. We have uh, uh, 
uh, controlled and optimal environmental conditions in terms of temperature, humidity, CO2, uh, airflow uh, inside the growing area. And the soilless cultivation techniques that I mentioned before allows us to stack the plants in multiple layers, one above the other, or in columns, one next to the other. So we can maximize our growing space uh, but also solar radiation is give, it's free, but it's not always the optimal in terms of what the plants do want. So since we try to control everything inside our farm, we apply exactly the light dimension that our plants need in order to photosynthesize and consequently grow in terms of biomass production. So we apply inside now mainly LED lights that they have a very long duration. They give uh, specifically a nanometer peaks of the spectrum that we want. They're very easy to, to control and to command. Uh, so we have the light solutions that we want in order to cover the three basic light dimension, the light quality, meaning the spectrum selection that we provide to the plants, the nanometer composition, the light quantity, meaning the intensity of photons that the lights are giving to the plant canopy, and the light duration, or else the photo period, meaning the, how many hours every day the, the lights are on and off. Okay. These are making a complex system that allows us to grow exactly what we want. We apply what we want in terms of volumes and capacities. And these values may be really different depending on the crop species. And so if we grow herbs or leafy greeneries or berries and uh, tomatoes, all these dimensions are different parameters. But also in the same crop, it may be different depending on the stage in the growth cycle that the plant has. So if okay. we're in the germination phase, we need different parameters. If we're in the growth stage or in the flowering fruiting stage, we may change some parameters. So online, I found somebody who talked about a home growing kit that they used and talked about the energy. The example they used is for growing potatoes in one square meter. So he did some quick calculations that said, basically you can get like two 2.5 kilograms of potatoes in one square meter of growing. And then he used 400 watt lights for 18 hours a day for three months. And then using electricity prices, that cost him approximately 30 euros per kilogram of potatoes, mm -hmm. which seems like a lot, right? That's, that's a lot of energy just for growing that many potatoes. But if you are talking about growing a square meter of lettuce, then 30 euros is kind of getting in the ballpark of what, what you might be paying for. And then when you scale up, when you industrialize and control for all the factors that you, you guys do, you can bring that cost down, that productivity mm -hmm. up, and then it's starting to look pretty reasonable at that point, right? So does that number, do those numbers sound kind of reasonable or? They do. Okay. But still, it's under a lot of different parameters that these numbers are coming. So we're growing potatoes for three months, while lettuce needs 20 days, and then it's out and it's harvested. I see. He has a very intense and uh, powerful of 300, as you mentioned before, as uh, I recall, of VAT lead lamps, which are, again, pretty powerful lead lamps. Also 18 hours of photo period while lettuce needs 15, 16 hours. Uh, so it's way a lot of parameters. When you're growing in a very small area, the business becomes profitable when we have more growing area that we need to cover. So we have heat exchanges inside the growing area. We have different kinds of parameters like uh, optimization of lead operation, their conditioning system, uh, all the energy loads that we have to process. So we never said that vertical farming is a, a cheap technology. Cheap is when we're growing in a traditional open field because solar radiation is for free. But when we need to provide this energy to the plants under very specific 
schedule of intensity, quality, and duration. Further optimization is very necessary. It's of vital importance for vertical farms when it comes to lighting operation, but not only to make LED lamps more efficient, because the more efficient they are, the more photons they are able to produce and less heat generation they are providing into the growing area. But it's also about the cultivation protocols that we apply into the farm. So the more precise we become to how actually we operate our LEDs and in terms of what nanometers we provide, what intensity, in under which photo period, but also under different stages of the growth cycle, we can make uh, different applications of LED, then we can reduce the cost for energy. And of course, renewable energy sources will always be the optimal solution of a, a synergy between vertical farms and energy provision. I think most of the farms that uh, are very profitable, they have source of renewable energies for the electricity inside the farms. Yeah, ideally you'd want to do things to drive down the electricity because that's one of the big exactly. costs of your of your uh, industry. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and that, that segues nicely into um, the science of the photons and the wavelengths, right? I thought maybe that would be something that you guys could do for efficiency, right? Plants are green, and so maybe you don't want to feed them green light, and you could just avoid that that whole part of the spectrum and just give them red light. Maybe that would make it kind of eerie if all the plants were kind of black, right? You're not giving them any green light to reflect. But um, at the same time, then, I thought plants, they've been through uh, evolution for, <laughs> for a very long time. They're probably optimized for sunlight, right? Sunlight is sort of like the peak of energy that comes from the sun, right? That's why we see in the light wavelengths that we do. And that's why plants absorb that because the sun emits the most energy at those frequencies. Different growers do all kinds of crazy things to make the plants. Uh, if you shine different wavelengths, they basically produce more and less of different chemicals or like different um, hormones, I guess the plants have. And um, so they'll feed them more UVs or infrared, and that'll make them grow bigger, more leafy. Or, and you said you even change it through the growth cycle. Okay. Solar radiation is a electromagnetic radiation. And it gives us a really wide spectrum from approximately 100 till 2,500 nanometers. Us humans are able to see from approximately 400 to 700 nan nanometers. And this is also the spectrum that activates the photosynthetic process of plants. It's almost the same range from 400 till 700. The plants are able mainly to use this kind of uh, wavelengths to absorb through their chlorophylls the radiation and activate photosynthesis. But there are a lot of buts. Plants can use mainly blue and red parts of the spectrum for the photosynthesis, but there are also different kinds of uh, wavelengths that they can also use. However, if we put in a LED lamp a lot of different peaks of wavelengths, it will be way more costly to, to operate and to work. It will need more electricity to operate. So that's why LEDs are only picking in specific lighting solutions that we want in order to reduce the cost uh, of the LED operation. However, a lot of research, the basic solution that we could say for LED selection inside vertical farm would be either a lamp that combines blue, red, and near infrared parts of the spectrum, or a white LED which mimics the solar radiation. However, a lot of different research has shown that there are also parts of the spectrum like green, orange, UV, that if we applied in a specific period in the growth cycle, like a UV now, it has been proven that if we applied a little bit before harvest, it can prolong the shelf life of plants. So ideally, we could apply different lighting solutions of different quality of spectrum combination in different stages of the growth cycle. But that would be way costly for the farms to invest in more capital expenses for more LEDs that combine different solutions. So most farmers apply blue, red, far red and white spectrum. 
different parts of the spectrum can influence different uh, morphological aspects or physiological aspects of the plants. And they can prolong the leaves, they can change the color of the leaves, they can change the, the aroma, the flavor, and activate different metabolites in the, the plant physiology and change the final product. So if I was suggesting something to a grower, I would be like, what is your crop? What do you want to grow? And then based on what is your product, we can find what is the optimal lighting solution uh, for your case. As a rule of thumb, I would say these two solutions that are mentioned are the most universal. But then if we want to be really precise and then maximize further the production, but also reduce our costs based on specific solutions, there would be further risks that would be necessary. Yeah, I just love the idea of using these because there's so many different parameters that you can tweak. And I'm sure scientists love doing experiments on this. Yes. This is exactly what you think of scientists doing for, for growing <laughs> plants, right? Yeah. So it sounds like there's a bunch of these inputs. We talked a little bit about energy, mm -hmm. there's electricity, um, water, and then I suppose we can talk a little bit about just the general infrastructure as well. Vertical farms, first of all, may be of, uh, they have a very big variety of sizes that we can find them. They can be either big warehouses that we install a vertical farm uh, or an abandoned building or an apartment or an underground tunnel or a container, which is really um very famous, or it can be an appliance farm or a growth chamber, or even something really small that we can put uh, in our house and we can use it as householders. Mm -hmm. So we can find a very big variety. And depending on the size that we have, also the business model is really different uh, in terms of inputs and outputs that we have and a different supply chain that we need uh, to work with. So we need layers, tires, either if it is uh, like a shelf or if we said it can be a column that will allow us to maximize our uh, yield production, as we said before. Also, a hydroponic system is not something that it is guaranteed because I have seen vertical farms that because they want to be signed as an organic farm, they have soil because in order you to be able to certify it as an organic grower, you need to have soil. Uh, in okay. Europe, for sure, I don't know for USA, but in Europe, you need to be growing in soil. So men, there are also vertical farms that they are growing in soil. What is absolutely vital is that we have the multiple layers and we have at least a basic kit of sensors that allows us to monitor the environmental conditions inside the farm in terms of temperature, humidity, CO2. These are really important for us because... We cannot improve our system if we don't know how is the actual situation that we have. And maybe we cannot um, solve any problems in terms of crop production if we don't know what stresses the plant at the time that we're growing. So a basic kit of sensor, if we can expand a little bit more, I would add sort of some sensors in the substrate environment soil or hydroponics, so we know the pH, electrical conductivity, how the nutrients are actually absorbed by the root zone of the plants. So also um, air conditioning system is of vital importance because we need to maintain the temperature, humidity at the levels that we want, the airflow that will allow us to reduce the heating and the latent heat that exceeds from the LED lights and allows us to have a uniformity in climate condition, uniformity, uniform climate condition, that will also mean that we have a uniformity in our production. The more uniform is the climate, the more uniform, the better is our production. Also, LED lights is something that we have almost in every vertical farm because it allows us to provide exactly the radiation that the plants need in the specific timing in order us to maximize and speed up the way that they are growing, the way that they are photosynthesizing. We, have, we can control the size of the leaves, of the fruits, the texture, the flavor, the spiciness. Everything can change with a different lighting solution. So LED, 
are of uh, a vital importance. And then also a control room area that we will have all the inputs from the different sensor and parameters that will allow us to see what is happening inside our farm. So the humidity, I suppose, is a big, big one as well. You're probably trying to increase the humidity a lot of times or... We yeah. try to control the humidity sure. because it is really connected with the transpiration of the plants. They are everything, humidity, temperature, everything is connected with how the plants are actually photosynthesizing, how much they are perspiring and transpiring. Uh -huh. So all these levels need to be approximately, let's say, 55% to 50 to 70% of relative humidity inside our growth area. But all these maybe really different depending on the crops that we are growing. I always figured that most of the electricity was used in just the lighting itself because you're trying to transfer energy into the plant to get it to grow. Mm -hmm. But I suppose a lot of it also is involved in this climate control. I would say that the majority, the vast majority of electricity demand is distributed for lead operation. Okay. Approximately 80% of the electricity demand is for LEDs. And then we have smaller percentages for pumps that we are using for the irrigation system, for uh, fans operation, for motors, computers, etc. Like all these numbers are way smaller compared to what the LEDs consume. Do you have some numbers for energy that we could get into? Maybe I'll, I'll give some typical things that people might encounter if people aren't dealing with, you know, units of energy, you know, just to give some people some idea of like how much energy things take. Like your home oven is, operates at uh, two to five kilowatts. So solar panels, um, like the typical ones you see on houses that are, you know, kind of like a square meter uh -huh. or so, those, those usually produce like 400 watts. Bikers, if you're, if you're like a good cyclist, you probably can't even get 400 watts, like the equivalent to one of those solar panels. Like I think a good biker gets about 300 watts. A typical LED light that we will use has approximately 30, 40 watt uh, consumption, but we don't put one. Now we are uh, designing a vertical farm for the Agricultural University of Athens for each growth tower. Each growth tower is, uh, consists of three uh, tires that we are growing, growing tires. So each tire uh, itself uh, has five LEDs. So in, in every growing tower, we have 15 LEDs of uh, 30 watt each that they are uh, consuming energy. Mm -hmm. So then, the numbers really big depending on how many cells you have how intelligent is your lead because there are also some leads now in the market that you can program them to change the nanometer composition depending on your growth stage and what uh, you actually want in the phase of uh, that you're operating it so these are way more intense lead in uh, energy consumption uh -huh. Okay, and so maybe a good way to talk about it would be um, power per area or per plant for a typical plant, like how much power do you shine on a head of lettuce or how much power do you put on a square meter of growing? The system consists of, uh, in terms of energy demand, okay. the main consumer is, as we said, 80% lighting. Uh -huh. Uh, then it's approximately 10% for pumps and fans. And then the rest 10% is for motors, computers, etc. So these are the main energy consumers. For a case that we conducted in uh, Denmark, our case scenario was a farm of 600 square meters. We actually show that the electricity cost for ventilation, lead operation, air conditioning, cooling, and all inside the technology equipment that we have, 1,200 kilowatt hours per square meter for the electricity demand. For a full growth cycle, is that right? For a full growth cycle, exactly. Okay including ventilation, lead operation, and air cooling. And at the same time, this farm was able to produce 33,750 kilos of fresh basil uh, per year. We can produce 60 kilos of fresh basil 
per square meter per year. And then depending on what is your uh, selling price, which is approximately what is for organic herbs and greeneries, we cannot go really higher than that because then it's not going to be really competitive in the market, but we are approximately what with organics. Uh, we actually show that uh, the vertical farm under different financial scheme scenarios of equity loan and subsidy. And we saw that for a farm that it is approximately 600 square meters of a uh, growing area, the investment of the project, the payback period of the investment is around four to five years, only for basil. Mainly the farms do not grow only one uh, product inside. They have different towers that they are occupied with different kinds of species. And also, always there is a nursery inside that it is uh -huh. providing fresh seedlings into the, into the main growth area. Uh -huh. So you can uh, actually organize what is going to be your production line depending on the season. If we have uh, special occasions like Christmas, uh, like a different kind of vacation that you need to provide into the market, different kinds of crops that they have higher selling price at that period, like berries that we use for cocktails uh, or for special dishes, microgreens, that they are really high value, higher value products uh, compared to just lettuce or arugula. So depending on what you want to grow and when you want to sell it, you can totally organize how it's going to be your production. I would also like to give you some comparison numbers in terms okay. of resource use efficiency between vertical farms, greenhouses, and uh, open field agriculture. Mm -hmm. So let's see a little bit how much we're actually using and how much we're actually producing. I will talk a little bit first about water. Uh, in open field agriculture, the water that we use in order to produce one kilo of fresh lettuce is 250 liters of water compared to a greenhouse that for the same one kilo of lettuce, we will need 20 liters of water. While uh, in a closed loop vertical farm, we will only need one liter of water for the same kilo of lettuce production. Then for our crop yields, we will be able to produce around four kilos of fresh lettuce per square meter per year in open field agriculture while 40 approximately kilos of, uh, per square meter per year of lettuce in a, inside a greenhouse and in a vertical farm that it has uh, 10 layers of uh, growing area, we can produce from 80 till 120 kilos uh, per square meter per year. Then, as I said before, we have the differentiation of the food miles how much the food is traveling from the producer to the consumer, which is uh, around 2,000 to 3,000 miles for the open field, around 1,000 for the greenhouses, and then a vertical farm, it can be approximately 50 miles if it is inside the urban area that we want. Also, really important is the surface use efficiency that we have, how much actually land we occupy in order to obtain one kilo of fresh lettuce, which for the case of open field is approximately 90 square meters for one kilo of fresh lettuce. In the greenhouse is nine square meters that we need uh, for one kilo of lettuce, while inside the vertical farm, it can be 0 0.3 square meters for one kilo of lettuce. So we can stack more in a square meter of cultivation area, but also we have way smaller growth cycles. If lettuce is growing in 70 days in the open field, inside the vertical farm, we only need 20 days of growth cycle, and then it's ready to be harvested and sold. Uh, I'm curious too, since you have such control over the environment, um, did you like keep them close together when they're young and then sort of expand the area yeah. as they grow? Okay. So that's something in, in some control. of the farms, we have three different stages of growth. So at the beginning, we have the seeds, 
uh, that they don't have the access to the light at all, and we are waiting for them to sprout. Then we transplant the sprouts into the nursery areas that we are waiting them to become a germination phase, to reach the germination phase of two to three leaves, actual leaves, real leaves, and then we transplant them into the main growth area. All these uh, different stages have different also um, planting densities. And then you also do, I saw one of your papers, you wrote about intermittent lighting. So um, mm -hmm. basically how, how often and for how long you, you light the plants, how that could be sort of a buffer on an electrical grid, you know, some sort of a way to um, not necessarily save electricity, but use it when it's not being used for other things. Is that something that people are, are actually doing or is that mostly in the research stage? It is something that it is uh, happening in some farms but it needs a lot of research in order to be modelized. What I was doing in my PhD research is, since I was doing my PhD in Denmark, the Nordic and Baltic countries uh, participate in an exchange pool of uh, energy, renewable energy, and uh, the energy uh, exchanges that they are conducting allows the grid to be fluctuated in terms of electricity pricing. So North Pool is giving us a two day ahead protocols of how the electricity prices are going to be for the next 48 hours. So we know when the prices are going to be high and when they are going to be cheap, cheaper. Uh, what I did is I modeled the protocol, the growing protocols of basil. Uh, I reduced, first of all, the photo period, which ideally based on literature is on 16 hours. But then my, I did my original uh, experiments with uh, 14 hours of photo period. So I first reduce the, the total energy input and demand of, the, of basil production by two hours. And then I split it the, these 14 hours into intermittent lighting intervals. So I knew how the prices are going to be for the next hours, but at the same time, I was monitoring the plant physiology and morphology and growth rate of plants in terms of photosynthetic rate, chlorophyll development, and different other parameters in plant growth. So I was able to detect if a plant is getting stressed by this intermittent radiation or not. If the plant was at the peak point, at the inertia point, as I call it, of uh, being stressed, then I was immediately open, uh, I switch on the LED lamps uh, immediately in order to avoid the plant getting stressed or else I was uh, continuing this uh, lighting protocol. And at the end, I was actually able to see that there were uh, approximately 20% energy savings for uh, the same yield production from a, a continuous lighting operation and an intermittent lighting operation. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there, there's a lot of ways to, to sort of optimize and produce more, get yes. more efficiency from using some data and, uh, you know, so, yeah. Also the reflectors can help us, uh, okay. battery systems, more uh, specific LED solutions, as I mentioned before, uniform climate conditions and uh, a specific knowledge of the cooling and heating loads inside the farm. There are a lot of different parameters that a combination of them or a selection or to use a part of them can help us to reduce our energy demand cost. So uh, let's talk about labor for a little bit mm -hmm. uh, because that's a huge part of agriculture, at least that's done outdoors, right? You think of these giant machineries to optimize sort of these processes of the harvesting and planting and um, the ones that can't be automated are stereotypically like one of the worst jobs you can do, right? So I imagine labor factors largely into the cost of these farms, but also I can imagine working inside and sort of these controlled environments might also be a much more, much more desirable job than working outside all day. So could you talk about sort of what labor goes into this besides all the information um, mm -hmm. calculations and stuff that you do? Yeah, labor is approximately 30 to 40% of the total operational cost inside the farm, depending on how big is your farm, meaning how many employees you need, there are the workers, but also we have the engineers inside the farms that they are operating the machineries, they are collecting and they are treating the data from the farm. 
And then we have data scientists probably. So there are a lot of companies that they are focusing on reducing the labor cost, uh, like uh, Seasony in Denmark is a company that I know that they are developing robots for the vertical farms that allows us to automate the transplant, uh, transportation of the crops, uh, harvest of the crops. Uh, and in that way, vertical farms can invest into heavier machinery like robots or like imaging vision with cameras, drones that they can be flying inside their farms to collect data. These farms are mainly based on data collection and they could be run only by data. The more automations we put inside the farms will help us reduce the labor cost, but also optimize and make the farms more autonomous in terms of operation and how we're handling the different uh, systems, different uh, uh, things that need to be done inside the farm. However, more uh, high salary employees like data scientists or engineers are important inside the farms because they are able to, to see that everything is working optimally. The, the costs that the robots are able to reduce is from the workers, that they are doing the most manual work. It's very common to have the cameras inside either in a static form that the camera is inside and is taking constant uh, pictures of the farm, or it is attached in a robot that it is flying in the multiple layers of the farm. These are really uh, common and applied technology solutions. So I think that covers a lot of our inputs, sort of all the considerations and trade-offs that you have to consider, especially contrasting with traditional farming, some of the advantages, some of the disadvantages you have in producing uh, different crops. So I want to switch a little bit now and talk about what markets are you going after? How does the price compare and the transportation, sort of the supply mm -hmm. chain, sort of like the final product, how does that compare to traditional farming? Uh, are you going after the same markets that these large agricultural companies go for, or is it sort of more niche and you sell it local to local restaurants and things like that? So if you could kind of explain the supply chain and you sell it and where you guys are trying to be competitive. Vertical farms are mainly addressed for urban uh, citizens, people that they live in high intense urban areas that they don't have access to fresh food uh, because food right now at the moment is traveling from the open field farms or from greenhouses between two to 3,000 kilometers every day from the producer to the consumer. So in that way, a lot of CO2 emissions are released from food transportation, but also a lot of quality is getting reduced from food pres preservation. So vertical farms are mainly addressed to local consumers, but also to areas where the, the soil is very infertile, uh, they don't have a very big areas that they can grow their own food, and at the same time, vertical farms are not in a position to compete with the open field farms because what we can grow inside is not stable food. We can grow mainly leafy greeneries at the moment, leafy greeneries, herbs, small fruits. We can grow microgreens, mushrooms, things that they are smaller and they don't occupy a lot of space, but also they have smaller growth cycles. So in that way, we cannot compete with open field farms because they can grow corn, maize, rice, something that it is not possible at the moment inside the vertical farms at the technology that we have now. I suppose things like where you eat the whole plant, like the herbs and the, and the lettuce, most of the energy then that you're, since energy is a big cost for mm -hmm. you guys, I'm, I'm assuming then those plants kind of use most of the energy then in producing the thing you're going to eat. Whereas if you're producing other crops like uh, potatoes and corn, like you said, a lot of the energy goes into producing the plant and you don't eat the exactly. whole plant. Right. Exactly. Okay. And it needs more time to stay inside. And then we also have a lot of waste that we need to treat. Like the trees uh, have a lot of wood that all of that we need to treat this waste after the harvest uh, collection. So we need something that it is... It has a lot of water content, uh, high nutritious values. It's something that we consume in a daily basis. 
and we need to be fresh and nutritious. Also inside vertical farms, we have significant maximization of the harvest that we can actually achieve per year. So in an open field farm, lettuce is harvested one to two times per year, but in a, in a vertical farm, it is 10 to 20 times every year. So we have way more production yields that we can distribute into the market concerning a specific product. Also, we can organize the farms inside in order to have a continuous year-round production of different kinds of crops that they will be all the time available to the consumers. So I suppose that that lets you uh, optimize things in many ways and save waste because uh, if you're only harvesting a few times a year, then you have to save that lettuce for much longer and lettuce doesn't last very long. So you save a lot of waste that way. Also, you're selling more locally, so a lot less is lost during transportation. So um, yeah, uh, lots lots and lots of produce is lost just in the supply chain of, exactly. our, of our normal food system. And, and this can make the system just overall much less wasteful, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, I read a number, you can tell me if this is right, that almost up to 50% of produce is just lost in the, our typical supply chain. I don't know if it's better in Europe. Yes. But, of fresh uh, vegetables and fruits are wasted in during the whole supply chain. So it can, it is also numbers of the final consumers of misorganization of the grocery shopping of every year. We buy more amounts that we can actually consume. There are losses in the transportation process, in the harvesting process, in the, in the field also we have losses. So one out of two of the vegetables that we are actually producing is wasted at the end. So there is a case of a farm in Berlin, it's called InFarms, that they have growth chambers that they are installed inside the supermarkets and the plants are growing from the beginning inside the supermarket. So it has zero miles of food miles that the food has traveled and the consumers are actually opening the chamber and they are buying uh, the product directly from where it was growing. Yeah. And, and, and of course the loss, so loss in the supply chain is a big issue, but that's of course not the only place where we lose crops, it, you know, throughout history, uh, drought is, or mm-hmm. you know, has mm-hmm. been sort of a classic, yeah, like, in the field. we've been dependent on, on thing on the weather, right? And like lots of crops are lost due to storms and flooding and then the opposite with drought. Um, you, know, you have diseases are a huge yeah. deal. And that's why we, of course, we spray so many pesticides and herbicides on all these things because we, we want to kind of preserve the plants that we want to grow. And mm-hmm. I guess basically all of this is avoided with indoor farming. <laughs> Is that yes. right? Yeah, yes. yeah. So it's just <laughs> this like is something 100%. that I cannot. Yeah, this is because we vertical farms are insulated growing areas that are isolated from the outdoor environmental conditions. So we really don't care if it is uh, raining, snowing, hailing outside, if it is too hot, if it is, uh, I don't know, something is uh, happening in a predictable and severe weather condition. So inside their crops are growing with their optimal environment that they could have with temperature, humidity, CO2, with a nutrient solution that they have access to from the root. They, they don't have a competition with other plants for sunlight access. So they just receive whatever they want. And this is the reason that they are also growing faster. Always the plants inside, they are way more protected than outdoor, but also the fact that It is such a very organized system of inputs. It will allow us to grow faster and better. And then, so it's not just preserving them so that they last longer, but there's also health and taste kind of benefits associated with a fresh harvest, right? That's why people like to garden because they can pick the food and eat it right there and it tastes a lot better, right? Hydroponics, they can actually influence the taste, the aroma, the texture, the crispiness. Probably the vitamins Everything. and minerals. Exactly, exactly. The nutritious value, the secondary metabolites, everything can be modified depending on the environmental conditions that we apply inside our farm. 
you mostly grow green leafy things um you said small berries do you guys do yes. that too okay um yes, how are we th just recently started that That's, okay because it, yeah, it's a tricky are... project <laughs> sure because when you think about like price per pound the berries are also something that makes sense to go after how do you i'm curious how do you pollinate those do you have insects in in the factories then or how do you pollinate the berries to get actually them we are developing now a small robot that it is able to artificially pollinate uh, our plants inside the the chambers that we have developed a lot of farms though are uh, selecting self-pollinated uh, cultivars like uh, cherry tomatoes that they don't need a female and a male plant in order to get pollinated uh, but there are uh, different technologies, even if just workers are going and they are vibrating the plants in order the pollination to travel inside the farm. Uh, but now we are trying to optimize it and automize it with some small robots. Let's see how this will go, because it's a very difficult project at the moment. I watched this YouTube video of um, a guy who grew algae using a, a solar system because plants convert very little of the actual energy that they that they see into growing the plant whereas out like you know very one to two percent one to two percent right yes. and then at some algaes and he found an edible algae that converted like 10 to 15 percent of the light mm -hmm. into biomass for eating um is there are people looking into this as an industry is this something personally are... we're not looking into this but i know there is a very high interest in uh, in terms of research and business interest for algae production because of the nutritious value because of how open it is a selection of a site site selection for growing algae I'm not really uh, into research about algae I cannot give a lot of information about that but I know that there is a high interest uh, into algae production okay cool. also inside vertical farms yeah. yeah yeah i love those sort of just totally new technologies like that it reminds me of sort of like people wanted to grow and eat bugs or something and it seems like maybe it's hard a hard sell for for the algae <laughs> compared to traditional vegetables just um yeah sort of sort of futuristic actually that's one of the things I think people might be really interested in as well with these sort of artificial growing uh, people who are like science fiction and things like that are thinking about <laughs> space travel now. Elon wants to go and set up colonies on Mars, right? So we're going to need... Yeah, the Martian, the movie. Yeah, exactly. Have grown potatoes. Yeah, so we're going to need something like this if we go colonize other planets, right? <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. we did really well with our planet. <laughs> we need to destroy another planet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I tend to share your bias there. Probably not, uh, not the simplest or probably best thing for us to do. Although yeah, I, like, yeah, yeah. I love course, the science behind it. It's, it's very cool to think about. Uh, are there, are there any other sort of future things that you are researching or the industry itself is, is researching? You know, whether they can be as science fiction as space travel or you know just sort of. More uh, things that I don't know about space travel, but uh, now what we're doing in uh, the Laboratory of Agricultural Construction is we're developing different farm facilities, different pilot models for various sizes of vertical farms. It's the first project of vertical farming that we run in Greece. We're conducting it via uh, Agricultural University of Athens. There is a lot of interest for this technology in Greece because we still have no farms already operating in terms of business model. There is a lot of risk interest, a lot of uh, investment interest uh, about vertical farms, even in Greece that it is blessed with solar radiation for the majority of months during the year. Uh, but with all this energy problem uh, and crisis that there is, we need to figure it out solutions that we can actually use excess Heat, heat loads and energy loads in order to distribute it in integrated systems that they are cooperating both for uh, in terms of wasted energy but also for food production so we're doing a lot of research with uh, berries with uh, artificial pollination with curtailment energy and wasted energy uh, from renewable energy systems and how they could be integrated systems of vertical farms with the renewable energy in order to make them even more sustainable. 
So these are our main interests. Uh, lighting, of course, lighting will always. always be a hot potato topic because the more you learn about light, the more you understand the potentials. It would be very juvenile for me to answer that I can tell you a lighting solution right at the moment for your uh, farm. Instead, it would be way more uh, better if I could understand the nature of the farm and what are the crops that they are growing and then define a very widely applied uh, solution for the farm in terms of lighting. It is something really complicated and yet very simple for the vertical farm, very important. And the more you deal with this, the more you understand how many more parameters are important to be further optimized, like uniformity and all the different dimensions that there is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, energy. It's going to be the big energy, factor in, energy. in every industry. Energy, from now, yes. For the foreseeable future, I think. Yes, yes. So. 2023 is going to be a difficult energy year. Okay, well, that's all I have. That was great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation, for your time. Mm -hmm.